Okay. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, it's definitely, you guys are working hard on projects. I love that. Last time I said, make sure you ask questions. <laughs> You're definitely asking a lot of questions. I'm gonna, if I haven't responded yet, I'm working on it. I'll get, get, get to you soon, but that's good. I love it. Uh, keep asking questions. There are a couple things that I feel like came up so many times. And, I, and by the way, when you present at the end, you should talk about the things that you got stuck on, the learning moments, you know, the aha moments. Uh, that's as important to me as the end result, more important to me than the end result. But there are a couple things, a couple themes that have come up a bunch of times. And maybe I'm just going to spend a few minutes sort of talking about it, just a couple of them. Because I think they are good learning moments, right? So um, one of the things I've seen a bunch, for instance, is we're doing trajectory optimization and your system that you're trying to optimize maybe is the multi-body plant with the, con with the scene graph here, right? <clears throat> and the multi-body plant has some collision geometry in it, okay? And you've got a new trajectory coming in, maybe that's the state, you know, so you're doing trajectory optimization on, the, on this plant. As soon as that plant has collision geometry and contact dynamics happening in the simulation, then that's the case when we talked all, when we did all the conversations about hybrid trajectory optimization, right? Where we talked about contact is difficult, it's often nice to summarize it as a discrete event that makes it better for the optimizer and all these things, right? I think people understood that, I hope people sort of understood that picture, but when it happened in the code, partly because snopped is a, you know, doesn't give guarantees, and so when it doesn't work, you don't know if it didn't work because of your formulation or you're in a local minima, okay? But I think oftentimes people are setting this up, having problems where snopped is not finding good solutions, but maybe not identifying immediately that one of the reasons for this is if you're coming into and out of, if your robot on the nominal trajectories is coming into and out of contact, the gradients are very discontinuous. The optimization landscape is very discontinuous, right? So some of you are explicitly setting a goal to see if you can take gradients through that full rich contact model, not do this, but right? just explicitly work in this. And I like that. I want to learn how far we get with that. In that path, I think like softening the contact model, for instance, is, is an idea that would make those gradients more well behaved. Okay, but I just, I think somehow in the complexity of saying I've got a plant and a scene graph and whatever, maybe it's hard to see that the thing that I was warning you about is actually happening in your simulator, right? So the alternative, and the other thing I've realized is that, you know, I gave examples in code of like, simple compass gates and slip models doing hybrid trajectory optimization. And then I gave you little dog, which is using the centroidal dynamics. So it's using the central, you know, with and using uh, forces as a decision variable in a hybrid trajectory optimization. I didn't, I haven't given you an example yet of like full on multi-body plant hybrid trajectory optimization. I think that would have helped like N groups where N is non, is, you know, greater than, much greater than one. So, so I'm going to see if I can do that this week. I know it's a little late, but, but I'm going to see if I can sort of make that easier for a few people. Um, but, but I think that's an, that's an interesting thing that has come up uh, a lot this time. I think, more, I, I tried to understand why it came up more this year than like in previous years. I think maybe just multi-body plant uh, gets farther. <laughs> I, think, I think maybe it would have just crapped out earlier or something before? I don't know, but I think people are getting farther without realizing that it's, that you've actually put yourself into a hard numerical situation, right? I think we support a little bit more gradients through contact and stuff than we did last year probably. So it's just, it just kind of lets you get into a slightly deeper well. <laughs> but um, well, that was a good one. And there's a couple others maybe I'll, I'll, I'll think about uh, when they bubble to the top, I'll, I'll mention them in lecture because I think it's good to, to learn. People understand what I'm what I mean by that. 
One other thing that I just uh, kind of at a high level, not quite about today's content, but um, so sorry we released the problem set late. But I'm super excited about it, and I want you to make sure that you realize what happened there. So last year we had a footstep planning problem, and it required solving a mixed integer quadratic program. And because the public solvers I can put on deep note are, are weak, you could only take like three steps. It was kind of not satisfying. Okay, so Sunbow rewrote it in graph of convex sets. Now it's gone from a mixed integer convex optimization to a linear program. And it solves like, you know, you can solve all day long and it's getting tight solutions. That's like cool, that's really cool. So, um, and, and it, I mean, it's, it also just is, makes the problem easy enough that it works with the public free solvers, which is like a, who cares? You shouldn't care about that, but I care about that because that makes like deep note work go farther for me or and for teaching, okay? But I was very happy about that. It took a few days. We released it later than I meant to, but, but it's for a good reason. Okay, so um, today we're gonna talk more about sto uh, stochastic systems and try to talk about the control aspect of it, right? So last time we tried to motivate how beautiful um, pro the probability distributions evolving under some nonlinear dynamics can be. This was just the Van der Poel oscillator example, but it's one of my you know, favorite, just kind of showing visually distributions moving around in nice ways. But that was, last lecture was just about the dynamics. Now the question is, if you have stochastic dynamics, how does that change the way you want to do control? Okay. Um, and right in general, we talked a bit about modeling, where the way we prefer to model these things, we now have a plant. It could be a multi-body plant. It could be our simple system. We have some model of our, of our system where we traditionally have you coming in and some observations coming out. And we will tend to prefer to think about randomness as coming in through an input port. And you'll see some of the reasons of, for that today as we think about the robust control view of these pictures. So the stochasticity enters through random inputs. Already one of the reasons that was useful is that we get to, kept, we get to keep using our state space models. So we just have our sort of similar equations, but we just added an additional input. And instead of immediately changing all of our dynamic description to, to the probabilistic notation, I can say the probabilities enter specifically here. This is being drawn from a distribution. We have to describe that distribution but even simple distributions can then be propagated through our deterministic equations. And that just bottles up the complexity to a certain place, and we can ask things about like, what is, a, if a, we put up a, a, a distribution here, you know, for each W, which is about then a random process in W, you can ask about what's the, what's the distribution of outputs look like, okay? And what we're gonna try to do then is is start to close feedback loops where we choose u so that we can make the relationship between w and z nice, for instance. That's kind of one of the goals for today. Um, I could teach, what one should teach an entire class on robust and stochastic control, okay? Um, maybe some of you might have taken some. The, um, but there's kind of a joke um, that even John Doyle, who wrote the book on robust control, he's, he says uh, robust control is encrypted, right? In the sense that you kind of like, you need to have a secret decoder ring to get in because most of the books and the classes often use very sophisticated mathematics. I think that's one of the reasons people like it. It's one of the reasons the field is mature, but it is relatively unwelcoming to newcomers when like, Sentence one is, you know, assume a Banach space, and then you, you know, you're like, okay, what's a Banach space? Like, I go back in, you know, like Hardy spaces and everything like this. I mean, it's all good. It's all, you can learn all that, but 
the ideas are actually very simple most of the time. So my goal is a little different. It's to try to make sure that the big ideas come through. And then when you want to see the Banach space formal statement of it, you'll have pointers. Okay. So I think that is not quite a one lecture goal, but it's a, it's a smaller goal. And um, I think we can make some progress today. Okay, so let's just think of a, um, the type of problem that you get into when you start thinking about these kind of setups. So um, imagine, I'm gonna do some bad drawings again. Imagine I'm a quad rotor, so many of you are playing with quad rotors too, okay? And I'm, I don't know, flying through Beggar's Canyon or something like this, okay? I've got a, a couple different big obstacles maybe a couple different paths I could possibly take. And I'm, uh, maybe I'll make it an, air, an airplane because I drew a top-down view. Okay, so there's a couple obvious paths I could take through this, through the canyons, okay? <clears throat> and what if I told you, for instance, that um, maybe I should have made one of them obviously geometrically different. Let me make this one like wide, okay? It's a nice wide canyon, but let's say it's very windy over here, okay? And let's say it's not so windy over here, all right? So which path should you pick, right? Um, it can suddenly become an extremely subtle question, right? Maybe there's some bends in this that are very, just on the edge of my dynamic limits. So even like a super small amount of wind here could knock me out of suc the successful regime, right? Um, or maybe, you know, I have so enough control authority to fly he through here, but there's so much wind here that this becomes more dangerous, right? So if you think about, we talked, remember, about those competing forces, about dynamics, kind of stable dynamics trying to bring you in, right? Noise trying to push you out, your distributions. But of course, it couples with, if you're following a trajectory, and your control authority on that trajectory also matters, right? It's, it's the same property. So if I think about the distributions here might be narrow, but you know, it's limiting on what I can, what those, how much I can shape those distributions over time, even when they're narrow. These are broad, but the dynamic constraints are easy. How do you weigh those trade-offs? Okay. So a lot of the exercise in stochastic and robust control, I think, really starts with uh, ask, asking the right questions. You know, just, just formulating the problem correctly, thinking about what kind of cost functions you should write given we're now talking about distributions, right? Should we be thinking about average performance, worst case performance? Let me make a, actually make a list here. There's a, so there's, there's questions that you could ask that would be formally, you know, correct ways to think about this. And then you kind of have to match your formalisms with things that are computationally tractable. Okay, so, so if I take the set of things that are interesting to ask about a problem like this and kind of match them with things that are computationally very powerful, then you get a hand, just a handful of different common formulations. So one would be average cost, right? So if I take, and I'm, you know, before I was doing the min over un of, let's say, over some finite trajectory, if that was my cost function before, then maybe it's enough to somehow, now that these are random variables, I have to say something more. Maybe I'll just take the expected value over, I have to say what I'm taking my expected value over, but where the randomness that's coming in here is my WNs are drawn from some probability distribution, and maybe my initial condition is drawn from some initial distribution on X. Okay, so maybe it's enough to just take expected value over many possible rollouts and try to, to optimize that. And so that, that could help you decide whether you want to go left or right, okay? But 
Um, and it's particularly easy computationally because all of our dynamic programming recursions still work. That's the big thing that's, that's good about this, right? Is that if I were, is I can immediately, because the expected value is a linear operator here, so I can just take that inside, basically. And then I can write the cost to go is the, is the min over u of the expected cost to go for the rest of it, and I get my dynamic programming recursion. We'll see that in a, in a specific derivation in a few minutes. Okay, so there's a lot of computational reasons to prefer that. This is the, this is the cost of choice typically in reinforcement learning for that reason. Almost always you're just doing average returns, okay. It's not so good if you want to guarantee performance, right? You guarantee you don't smack into the, you know, it says on average I'm pretty good, but there's always going to be some probability that I smash into the, into the wall, so maybe that's not what you want, okay? Maybe it is what you want, it's, right? Your airplanes are cheap, you've got a lot of them, you know, I just want them on average to get through, right? Okay, so that's like the number one uh, most common, I would say, approach to stochastic control. You can also try to do worst case, where instead of saying, let's say that these things are drawn from some distribution, maybe I'll say that Wn is in some set of possible, um, this is just some, some set of possible values, maybe you know, all of the noise, the wind is always between negative one and one, okay? And I could say x0 is in some initial set of, you know, there's some polytope or an ellipsoid of possible initial configurations and I'm guaranteeing it's inside that. And then I'd like to promise with probability one that I'll succeed and get through here. And that's another useful formulation and in cases certainly in the linear control with polytopic uncertainty and things like this, we have pretty strong tools for that. Now, it's interesting, th you know, this is, tends to be the stuff of robust control. This tends to be more stochastic control. If you just want to put names on it, that's a little too simple, but, but if you want to sort of say this is, this is kind of the stochastic control. And this is historically a little bit more robust control, but again, that's a dramatic oversimplification of two super rich fields, okay? <clears throat> It's actually interesting, the, it's not that, um, when I first learned about these things, my initial reaction was, oh, you know, the robust control folks are just really pessimistic, <laughs> right? They just must be unhappy people, right? Uh, you know, that they're saying that the worst could always happen to me, I have to think about the worst case all the time. But I was wrong. They're not unhappy people, they're very nice people. Um, and, and actually, they're very wise people, I would say, right? Um, I, I don't think they think that there is a, you, that you can put absolute bounds on the disturbances. That, that's just an approximation. In fact, I would say, if you look at these two alternatives, right, this actually seems like a strong assumption to say that I actually know the distribution of possible noises that's gonna happen. That means you've modeled the noise and have some reasonable confidence about the, the set of distributions you'll experience. And that's a tall order, potentially. So the robust control philosophy is actually asking less, right? It says, I just, I don't want to say what the probability of, ha of this thing happening is. It's just enough to put, saying it could be anything, any support over some possible sets, right? If I had bounded support of this probability distribution, right, then, then this is only more of an ask, right, than that. Okay, now again, so you can ask, um, even in the robust control case, it's not always probability one kind of statements. There's also things we'll talk about, um, you know, gains. So, so you could say that the, the input to output gain is guaranteed to be under some, some value even if the performance is stochastic. So there's, there's lots of things that go back and forth. You'll understand that by the end, but I just, I just feel bad having written robust control only this 
That's not, that's too simple. There's much more to it. Um, so I would say maybe that, that other thing I was talking about would be sort of a relative worst case. So like input, output, gains, which says if your input stays small, then I'll guarantee your output will also stay small. Okay, but there's many more formulations you might like. Um, people talk about risk measures. There's ideas from operations research, value at risk, conditional value at risk tends to be a little better than value at risk to work with. They talk about, they focus on what you can talk about at the, at the tails of the distribution, for instance. Okay. Um, we're seeing a lot of tools, uh, a lot of new formulations that use the notions of regret, which comes from, uh, well, it's, comes, it's old, but it was re-popularized in the world of online optimization and machine learning. So maybe what you'd say is you'd like to bound um, the, your performance relative to a, some, um, some reasonable policy. So for instance, you could say, um, I'll, take two air I'll take two problems. One of them, you know, in both cases, I want to fly through the, the corridors. I'll say I've got a privileged controller that gets to know what the random values of the wind are going to be. Okay, they get to cheat and say, I know exactly what the wind is going to be. It's not random anymore. It still enters my dynamics, but it's no longer, it's known to me. Okay, and then you could say, how well does my, the controller I'm actually going to execute do compared to the one that actually knows, gets to know that extra information. And so you can, that's another way to sort of measure your performance in a stochastic environment would be to say, how well do I do compared to somebody that knew more than I, I did. Okay, and there's just, there's a handful of these, right? And, and I, try to, I try to lay them out a bit in the notes. The, it is every year, you know, it's always project season when I start talking about these things. So the notes are not quite as far along in the later chapters because I spend so much time helping with projects and not enough time writing the notes. But I think it's kind of lays this out and hopefully gives you some references. Um, and then there's a couple other ideas that I just call out that um, you might see that I will, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, if you want to do constrained optimization, then there's a notion of sort of moving constraints into a probabilistic setting. So for instance, before in a deterministic setting, I might say, you know, fly through the corridor, you know, minimize the sum of my costs, you know, and say that g of x u is less than or equal to zero, right? Now that these become uh, random variables, I can't just write g of x u equal to zero. I have to do something more than that. So the, one of the natural ways that people try to, to generalize that would be to say, um, like if I, you know, I have to change my objective to somehow being a statement about the random variable, Okay, but maybe I can say, for instance, the probability of g of x u being greater than zero is less than some threshold. Right, these are kind of the modeling paradigms that we use to go that way. You could also ask alpha to be zero, and that would be a worst case constraint. Say that, you know, that, that would kind of be, if, if I bounded my uh, if I had bounded support of W and X, I could absolutely say, 
with probability one, I want to guarantee that that constraint is satisfied. Okay, so that's the broad landscape of like um, how we have to change our thinking. And again, like I've done over and over, I think you can understand a lot in the simple settings. Like the things we understand almost completely are finite state, finite action, finite time, Markov decision processes. We understand everything about that. And you can ask all these questions in that setting. Linear optimal control, there's LQR equivalents for these kind of questions. We understand a lot about that. And we understand the things that are, you know, if we don't know how to solve something, it's, we probably have a hardness result for why, it, why it's, it's hard. Okay, and we, so I'll study, we'll study a few of those just to kind of under, understand those implications. And then there are nonlinear extensions, right? That, that you get less deep understanding, but you get some strong algorithms out that can be very useful. So I thought that the right coverage to kind of give you some sampling of this would be since we've thought a lot about LQR and you understand that pretty well, we could do a little bit of sort of the, in the linear optimal control setting. I think we can fairly well understand stochastic LQR, which would be I have an expected value. This is the average cost case. And then we can do a guaranteed cost or a worst case LQR, okay? Sort of a worst case, if you will. That's not what people would quite call it, but that's, I think, for the storytelling, that's what I'm going to call it right now here. And um, so we'll, we'll develop a Riccati equation solution to talk about L2 gains and talk about how we can use the Lyapunov arguments to generalize into the stochastic setting with dissipation inequalities. And then for sort of nonlinear, I think the most useful thing to talk about is stochastic trajectory optimization. You can do worst case on that too. I don't think I'll have time today. And I thought just in terms of like usefulness, I think maybe I'll do it in this order. Okay. I know that was very high level, but I just, I feel that if I just dive into the math, you're not going to see how things fit together. So hopefully that kind of sets the stage and was okay. Yes. Hey, do these cost functions also apply for like graphing machine state estimation or is it just controlling? Awesome question. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we're going to have another lecture where I start talking about output feedback which now I, that includes the state estimation problem. Again, there's whole classes on state estimation. Um, so these are the precursors to that. But I'm actually going to study the case where, the, um, where we're still in state feedback, but there's noise first, just to build up to that. You can, of course, if you have an observer, if your plant model includes an observer and your, um, and your plant, then you can study that system with the tools for today. But that's a, an add-on, actually. Any other high-level questions or good or process-level questions? Yeah. Oh, definitely modeling uncertainties too. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, these questions are actually extremely deep. I like, I, I try to, you know, again, I, I kind of intersected what you might want to ask with what we have good tools for, but the question, I mean, it's, it's actually a very deep question about why should I go 
one way or the other, or like um, the one that gets me is, why do any of us get on an airplane to fly, right? It's terrifying when you like read about the cracks that are in wings and, and all this stuff, right? So like if we were doing worst case control, we wouldn't get on an airplane, you know? So it's the statistics, right? There's some statistical argument that made it okay, or maybe some social argument or something, like my friend got on the airplane, so it's, because I don't know if everybody really thinks about statistics. They but some, Ohio. say it again. That's true. Yeah, okay, fair. So, so it's safer than driving. So why do I drive? Yeah, if, I, if I'm worried about airplanes, then, then, then like riding a bike is terrifying. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. So these are good, okay, that's good, Those are, these are good, everybody says airplanes are super safe if you didn't hear, but um, still, okay, so why do we even like wake up in the morning and get out of our house, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, these are actually very interesting, like why do we make, are we rational decision makers, right? Or how do you make a, 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 a certification case for an autonomous car, for instance, right? That's where this comes up a lot. It's very hard to think about you know, what levels of guarantees we should be able to expect when the world is very, very complicated and we have autonomous systems in the loop. Okay, let's think about stochastic LQR, yeah. And um, I hope that the pictures that we drew last time will still be with you and uh, will help you think about what happens here in the LQR case. Because of, you know, everything's a little easier to write in the, prob the stochastic processes in discrete time, I'll stick with discrete time, but we can do it in either. And I'll keep it particularly simple. I'll just say that Wn doesn't even have a, I mean, you can put a matrix in, in here to have Wn come in differently to different x's, but I'll just leave it simple. And um, I'll say this is mean zero iid gaussian right so that i the expected value of any draw is zero and two time steps are independent it's zero If I, you know, the, the noise that I draw at, at time three is completely independent of the noise I drew at time two, and then I'll call it um, sigma squared uh, otherwise. And my cost function then is going to be the expected value of my original cost. We can think about what this is going to be. Let's say I'll, I'll just, I want that, I want to think about the inf infinite case, but let's allow for that. Okay, so what do you immediately start thinking about this problem? So what Am I, do you think I'm able to go to infinity, for instance, in this? Right? We talked a lot about um, stationary distributions. We've spent the whole class talking about you know, infinite horizon stability kind of properties. But we also talked about you have to be careful when your sums go to infinity that your cost converges. Right? You don't want your cost to go to infinity. What happens here? Does the cost converge? No, right? Because, like, the best case, really, is that I obtain, let's say I, I find u equals negative 
kx, you know, I get some nice system that looks like a stable controller, where this is stable, but I still have this random noise coming in. So if, remember, I tried to draw some of these as like potential functions. So that would be a quadratic potential function. This would be x. This would be, if I were to think about that as a potential function, I'm just calling u of x. And then I have a steady state distribution. Even if I've done a good job with control, I have a steady state distribution that's going to look something like this. Okay. Let me even I'll repurpose this. I, let's say if I just wanted to call this um, the plot of x transpose qx. Okay, that's my cost function. Okay, so the expected value, okay, of the uh, of the state, if I've done a good job, will probably be zero. But the expected value of a quadratic function, you know, integrated over this is not going to be zero, right? On average, I'd, I will accumulate some cost on every step, right? I'll, if I take the expected value of this for, over that distribution, I'm going to get a non-zero value. Okay, so that means even if I do a good job and I've, I've got some nice stable thing, I'm going to be accumulating cost as time goes to infinity, yeah? Okay. Nice, nice, yeah. So, so uh, one way that people often, um, so remedies, yeah, great. I think uh, one of the standard things to do would be to change the cost function to be to do some sort of average um, cost, yeah. Yes, very, very good. Another one we've talked about briefly would be if I put a discounting in front of here. Right, if I put gamma smaller than one and I discounted. Those can both work. This is often what happens if you're in the in the RL, right? These are the these are more common approaches in RL. If you were to apply RL to this problem, you would almost certainly um, use those tricks to make it work. It turns out for this particular problem, you don't need to do either of those. That even though the cost goes to infinity, it goes to infinity in a special way and you can still design the optimal controller out of it, acknowledging that J goes to infinity, okay? And I won't do every step of the Riccati equation. I'll try to give you the insight. But it is really just an exercise. You know, if you go through the LQR derivation we've already done, and now work through the expected value of it, then you'll get um, you'll be able to work through this. Okay, so. In particular, we, remember we had to choose, for LQR, we chose the quadratic cost to go, and then we started working with that. And it felt a little bit like, where'd you get that from? But, but all I have to do is convince you that I have a solution to the Bellman equation. And quadratics are the right solution. I just didn't present it quite as that way. So let's just say that J of star, st star at the end step, before we chose it to be x n s x, maybe I'll, I have a different quadratic form for each n, and we're going to try to take the limit as n goes from infinity back to zero, let's say. This is what we did in the deterministic case, and we worked through it. It turns out that this is just a constant. It's a, it's a function of, of n. Um, Okay. It turns out that the, the cost to go is going to look like our standard quadratic cost to go. It's just going to be raised up higher and higher and higher as we accumulate cost. And Cn is going to go to infinity. There's no denying that. 
but because the quadratic form is still well behaved, you can still figure out what optimal action you should be taking as your cost slowly goes to infinity. The way to see that is by writing the Bellman recursion. This is J star at N equals, um, let's see, plus C of N is the min over U of the expected value of the one step cost plus J at N plus one star. Okay, this is in the um, discrete time case. It looks like this. This is n plus one, c n plus one. That equation kind of makes sense. The, 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 as I re recurse back at n, I'm going to take the, it's going to be equivalent to the one step cost plus n plus one. This has no, is, has no randomness in the one step version of this. Okay, but this, we have to think about the expected value of that term. So we can actually move the expected value from the entire sum into being the expected value of just the, the part where w comes in with randomness. And it turns out that after a few steps of narrowing what the randomness can do, okay, you get min over u of x transpose qx plus u transpose ru plus AX plus BU transpose SN AX plus BU. Okay, these parts were all deterministic. And the randomness is actually delegated to, to a relatively smaller contribution here, which is we get this AX plus BU plus W SN W. There's a few terms like, like that, okay? Most of them actually are zero because by our Gaussian IID assumption, many of them cancel. But the one that remains is our X transpose, sorry, W transpose SN plus one W remains. And it turns out that the solution to this Riccati equation is exactly the solution, sorry for the plus one there, is exactly the solution of the original deterministic LQR plus some con condition that C of N equals C of N plus one plus the expected value of the covariance here. That's just how the math works out, okay? The, the important point is that all of the, all of the uh, randomness contributes to a constant term here, and that this SN, not only do we have this nice qu quadratic form here, but that's the same S from the deterministic LQR. It turns out that the solution to the stochastic LQR problem is to do deterministic LQR, forget about the randomness, okay, and just admit that your total cost is eventually, is slowly gonna go up. It's one of the surprising results, yeah. Now that is, that becomes, so if you do like stochastic LQR along a trajectory, where, like if you did an iterative LQR, for instance, then you can get different strategies out of a stochastic analysis. The, the reason for that being that you, if you're taking 
um, approximations of your cost that are not zero at the origin, then you, you start having cross terms between the noise and your objective, which can change the optimal solution. But in the standard stochastic LQR, the actual story is that deterministic LQR is still optimal. It's one of the biggest results, I guess, in, in all the state feedback kind of control. Even when you have state estimation involved, it still turns out to be optimal to build a state estimator and then you run a deterministic LQR. That's called the separation principle. It's one of the best and worst things that happen to control because it's only true for linear Gaussian systems. And people do it all, like people do it everywhere, even though it's only optimal for linear Gaussian systems. Okay. So LQR can be generalized fairly easily into the stochastic setting if you did average cost. And really, most of the, like you can do the same sort of, because that Bellman recursion works, you can do value iteration in the stochastic setting. But almost all of our tools that are based on, you know, that the cost to go kind of analysis will still work in the stochastic. They have natural analogs. A few of you have been asking about, um, you know, the traje robust trajectory optimization. And I do think that stochastic trajectory optimization is a great thing. And it's because it follows so naturally with the expected value, the average cost sort of expected value trajectory optimization is just a pretty natural extension to what we've already done. And it can give you some extra um, robustness, or well, certainly not robustness, not in the worst case sense, but it can allow you to be uncertainty aware. Oh, before I do, there's a cool example. Let me, let me give you a cool example. All right, so um, this, okay, so, so this is the main result. Deterministic LQR solves it, but it assumed Gaussian IID mean zero noise, okay? Um, it turns out there's a place where it recommends you do something differently. And we had some examples of this actually in the perching case. We, we spent some time thinking about perching outdoors, okay? This was, actually I should set this up, it's kind of fun. Well, so. What you're about to see is, it is our same perching airplane, which we used to fire around inside, okay? We wanted to bring it outside. And the first question about that was actually, how do you figure out where the perch is? We used motion capture indoors initially, and we didn't have motion capture outdoors at the time. So Joe, um, who was working on that, did an excellent, had an excellent idea. He said, I'm actually gonna use, so um, the Air Force actually wanted to land on power lines with, per with planes, right? They said, wouldn't it be great if we could land on power lines, like we could recharge our batteries maybe, maybe we could snip the line, or maybe we could like listen to some, I don't know, use it as a, hijack it as a communication. I don't know exactly what the you know, goal is, but I thought that's cool, let's land on a power line, um, <laughs> act like a bird, you know, act whatever. Um, it turns out then, so um, Joe made the observation that if you put a magnetometer on your airplane, then you can use the B field emitted by the power line to localize the perch, right? And in particular, it's, it's like the plane isn't very big, so having the difference in the magnetic field, even though it's, uh, you know, inverse square law or whatever, but it's, it's hard to just have two magnetometers and know very much. So, but he wrote a, a dynamic estimator that as the plane moved, it was able to move through the magnetic field and estimate and refine its estimate of where the perch was just based on the magnetometer. Very, very cool, okay. So then it's like, oh, now we can take the perching plane outside. But it's windy outside, especially around the Stata Center, which is like, yeah, not laminar flow. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, that's, there's like eddies and whatever. I, I think you could do almost anything aerodynamic modeling wise uh, around, around the Stata Center and still be a very approximate. Okay, so this is Joe's experiments. On a nice day, he was able to land on the perch pretty reliably but with some probability, the wind would come in 
And it was like, you have no chance. There's not even a propeller on that plane. So he's like, OK, I, there's other places I could try this. Some of you will recognize these venues. OK, landed on the perch until the wind comes in. Whoops. And we had to make a new airplane because then you know, that net was supposed to protect us. But yeah, if you go over too far, you're gone. So um, uh, yeah, kind of like Steve's. OK, so then so you remember that the way. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I haven't made as many as Joe and Rick have, uh, but I definitely spent my time. Yeah, definitely. That's the reason why they're foam planes uh, with very little onboard everything. So you can just crank them out on the laser cutter. Yeah. Plus, it's scientifically mi minimal. You know, it's kind of a nice. Uh, OK, so remember that the way we did those perching experiments was we did trajectory optimization, and then we did time varying LQR along a trajectory. I'll tell you the rest of the story about that um, soon, about you know, the, the whole funnel experiment uh, set up. But <coughs> uh, we decided to try to get a little bit smarter about doing the LQR with the, root, with, the, with the wind. So we actually bought this awesome thing. In fact, if you walk by our lab and you look in the window and you think, what is that strange device that looks like, uh, like a ray gun from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or something, right? This is a Doppler anemometer, right? It measures the wind in, in all the axes. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's about yay big. Uh, we put it next to the perch, and we tried to use some real-time information first about the, about the wind. That was very hard to close the feedback loop through that, especially since we had our you know, little remote-controlled airplane. But <clears throat> what we could definitely do was collect statistics about the wind and come up with distributions of, of the wind. And one of the things, you, not surprisingly, the wind is not Gaussian IID. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, if it's blowing at five meters per second on one second, it is not going to be, it's, it's highly likely it'll be something like five meters per second on the next sample, especially when you're sampling at high rates, right? It's not just changing completely randomly between samples. Okay, so how do you think about that in the control design? So we just said we know how to do LQR when we're Gaussian IID, but we're not Gaussian IID, so what do you do about that? There's, a, there's really two standard wind models that people use. There's the von Karman um, wind model and the Dryden wind model. Okay, but both of them are roughly, you take in your W, let's say, which is Gaussian IID, and you put it through a filter to make colored, this is my wind now, right? This is even a linear filter. Okay, that makes colored, not white, in the spectrum um, wind model. Okay, so a pretty reasonable way to model wind is to think of an IID Gaussian, put it through a linear filter, and then pass that into my, my plant. Okay, so if you do that, do that for a quad rotor, for instance, then you start getting simulations that kind of look sort of reasonable. You know, this is just the planar quad rotor with some gust model pushing it around. Okay, and that looks more like what we saw to see. And we were able to calibrate it to the, in the perching case, we calibrated it somewhat carefully to the distributions we saw. <clears throat> okay, but we only know how to do LQR for, the, for this simpler case. So here's the trick. And it's actually super useful, right? Why not do LQR for this system, OK? Now I have a system that's Gaussian IID, OK? I, have a, I could pull my input port out, whatever. What, what do I get then? I get u equals negative kx, right? That, that's coming out my deterministic LQR controller. But x here, this is a, um, you know, x here is
includes, like the linear filter written in a state space form has state variables associated with it, right? So there's like a couple state variables that are doing the filtering. So what this, this proposal tells you that you might not have thought of otherwise is because it's optimal to be against Gaussians, one of the things you can do is actually try to estimate the state of the wind Instant, you know, in the short term, you try to estimate what the current, uh, you know, wind conditions are, and then use the estimated state of the wind in your feedback controller. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, nope. You uh, you can have you're underactuated, right? You don't have direct control of it, but we know how to do that. That's right. Good question. Yeah, you don't have direct control of the wind state, but you you know given the state, how it's going to affect your, your robot. So we have, if you just even do it in the time invariant case, then you can take, this was using the, you know, we put a wing on it just so you could see and think about what the, what the wind was actually doing to the, to the plane, okay? But a plane in prop hang, and LQR does a beautiful job of stabilizing that with the wind especially in the case where the wind is exactly, you know, generated by this, this process. So I made a simulation that used this model and then I made a controller that used that model, okay, and then it stabilizes beautifully. And then as always, the question is, how well does that model capture the real world? How well are you able to estimate the state of the wind in the real world? And you have an estimation problem, okay? But that is a kind of a lesson from this that is sort of more than just what deterministic LQR would have said. Yes? Um, if you run the LQR on it, isn't, isn't it going to try to also um, stabilize the wind itself, the wind factor? So do you just put like zeros for the... Yes, um, exactly right. Good, good point. Yeah, so the cost function could be that you don't have to try to stabilize the wind. Okay. Yeah, good. You could just put the Qs associated with the wind to be zero. Very nice. I had actually forgotten that detail, but you're definitely right. Okay, so LQR solves everything, right? Um, I mean, clearly not, right? This is gonna work in the linearized regime, um, but there's actually just a, a more important and more sort of famous uh, limitation of this, which is that we know doing stochastic analysis is not gonna give you worst case performance. It was stated most famously by John Doyle with one of the best abstracts of all times, okay? He wrote a paper. Um, I, the story goes that his paper in the Transactions on Automatic Control, top journal in, in automatic control, was are there stability guaranteed margins for LQG regulators? And his abstract was no. <laughs> and the reviewers and the editors said, I can't accept a paper with an abstract that just says no. <laughs> so he, this was his you know, resubmission. <laughs> And they're, they're like, okay, fine, whatever. So that goes down as like the best abstract of all time, right? But what is that? So LQG is the output feedback version of LQR, but, but, it, but it's true of, LQ, of the uh, stochastic LQR too. And the point is you can't guarantee the performance of the stochastic process. You can just say it's happening on the average. Okay. That was stochastic LQR. Let's think about trajectory optimization. Maybe I'll do it over here. Again, if you're in the average cost sense, then if my, um, my goal is to find some trajectory that minimizes now the expected value of my cost function over time. Now I'll do it over a finite time. And I'm going to do this, you know, subject to the dynamics and all the stuff we've been, we know and love, how to write trans, uh, direct transcriptions and all these things. Okay. 
but how do we do, like this WN is a nasty thing, right? How do I tell my trajectory optimization that WN is being pulled from some distribution? The standard approach to do that would be to approximate this expected value with a small number of samples. Okay, so basically I'll do n rollouts with n different choices of w, and I'll optimize those n rollouts or the average cost of those n rollouts. All right, so maybe uh, even in practice, what you could say is, uh, in like the code, choose n, maybe not n, let me call it m random seeds for my random number generator. Generate WN for each seed. Now I can write deterministic costs and constraints given WN, right? Solve M deterministic dredge opt subject to U of N being the same for all M. All right, that's really important. You're only ever going you're only actually solving for the open loop U. Okay, but if you're rolling it out that same U trajectory M times. X, if you're doing a direct transcription, X is going to be different on each of those, but U must be the same. Okay, and then you, of course, compute the average cost. Uh, the, uh, you approximate the expected value by the, the average of those rollouts. Okay, this can be hugely useful. It's, it's really not much harder than what we've been doing before. Right? It can give you some sense of trying to be robust to disturbances. It can do some of the things that we're seeing in LQR. With relatively small M, you can capture a lot. It's, you, know, you worry about thing, doing this in high dimensions and everything like this, but people have, in practice, taken surprisingly small number of rollouts and seen benefits from that. And the real deeper question, I think, which I'm sort of convinced the answer is yes, but, but we're still working out all the details of the, of the math and everything, right? Is that I really think that the optimization landscape of this problem, I think this problem will have less local minima than the deterministic version of the problem, right? Especially as M gets large. Because like oftentimes local minima in trajectory optimization, you get into these kind of quirky solutions where they're obviously not right, but doing better would require something big, right? You have to violate a constraint to get back out of your quirky solution. And if you're firing out like lots of, I mean, this is in the perching, imagine I just have like suddenly, I'm doing lots of different rollouts with lots of different wins, right? And if from, let's say even the same initial condition, you could sample over initial conditions, that's fine. But somehow to have the entire distribution of those all doing something reasonable tends to get rid of some of the quirky local minima. I'm not saying your project that doesn't work today will immediately work tomorrow if you do this, but I, my, in practice, I've seen this be a useful thing. Everybody's like, maybe though. <laughs> if there's a chance, I'm willing to take it. Yeah, yeah, right? I do think this changes the cost landscape, right? And the, so, some of the stories I told you last time about um, you know, the way taking random, uh, you know, probability distributions can smooth out the effects of contact. You know, it has, I think that's part of the story of sort of understanding what these uh, objectives are doing. And there's various, people have written things like this in lots of different ways with lots of different notation. Um, so you'll see this, I think uh, the Berkeley folks, Sergey Levine and company, really like the Bregman divergence ADMM version of this. I've heard that works, ver that worked very, very well for them when they were doing that work. And it, it's, a, it's an interpretation of doing this sort of stochastic gradient descent. Sorry, you had your hand up.
Yes. Just a function of the time. Good. Uh, so it's not just like responding to the trigger. Nice. That's, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, would let you, I would let you say it or I could say it. But did you have, do you have the, the next part? No. OK, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so important observation, right, is that um, so in the deterministic case, if you just have u and you're going to traverse some x, then there's sort of that's all you need until you model something else about disturbances or something like this. So you, having just kind of an open loop u um, is fine. As soon as you have a notion of the disturbances, you could ask to optimize not just u, but actually a policy that is converging on that trajectory and is responsive to the different x's. That's a richer, now the, you know, having more than just un being the same, you could have u equal, you know, un nominal plus minus kx, for instance, would be a, yes. So you can do better by trying to add a bit of a, a feedback controller into your optimization, yeah. So one of the ways people do that, for instance, is when you do iterative LQR in the stochastic sense, yeah, in the SLQ paper, for instance, um, then you get to think about the closed loop performance in a random rollout setting. Yeah, so iterative LQR has the benefit of thinking about closed loop performance. Yep. Okay, yeah, maybe it'll solve all your problems. I don't know. Tell me if it does. Are there big questions about that? I mean, that's, that was a very simple sort of treatment of it, but, but I, I do think it's, um, it's pretty much that simple. I mean, I think um, you can do things like starting to add chance constraints with the chance being evaluated by the number of violations of, of, your, you know, of your constraint. Okay, that's a very approximate thing. Normally, people would try to do chance constraints a little, a little bit more carefully by having Gaussians that evolve over the over the distribution or things like this, but all of these things can work in just a Monte Carlo approximation of the expected value. Yes? Does stochastic regression optimization have that same characteristic where if there's mu zero i regression, like So, um, the subtlety comes in. So the question was, does iterative LQR still have the same property that we talked about? It's the same as the original one. So um, remember that iterative LQR makes an affine approximation of the dynamics. So it's AX plus some nominal, because it, because it might not be that the uh, dynamics are, you're, you might not be considering even a feasible trajectory. You could have an, uh, you know, if it's a first order Taylor approximation of the dynamics and a second order Taylor approximation of the cost. So as soon as the Taylor as soon as the dynamics are affine instead of linear, or the cost or even the covariance of the rollout doesn't have mean zero or doesn't have the quadratic on the trajectory, then you can get different answers in the stochastic LQR than the original LQR. So it does give you extra, it does give you a different answer. I have to make, certainly iterative LQG gives you a different answer. I'm pretty sure iterative LQR should, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, just thinking it through, it should uh, give the same, the different answer because the covariance may not be zero mean. Yeah. Cool. I'm looking at the clock and saying that I shouldn't introduce like dissipation inequalities with five minutes left. So, if you ask any more questions, then we can just end a few minutes early and I can answer more questions. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so this is a small question about when you had the white noise and then you split it up into the spectrum. Yeah. Let me think. So, I mean, Gaussian noise is a weird thing, right? It's um, uh, it's mathematically super convenient, but it says that like absolutely ridiculous things will happen with some probability, right? The tails of a Gaussian are tend to be bad for any sort of a worst. It's very hard to put a worst case analysis into something that has Gaussian noise unless you really have something of your dynamics that's just clipping those bad those badness, right? So, um, I would say. 
I, I didn't fully understand the question, but I, I would say it, it's in general, once you're in the Gaussian noise setting, it's very hard to recover. I mean, you could talk about the tails of the distribution, how big they are, but you're almost always going to have tails of your distribution in the Gaussian sense. Yeah. Yes, yes, so um, that's the thing I'm not going to introduce in the next five minutes, but there's a natural, so there's an extension, but, but I promise I'll do it next time. But um, yeah, so let me just cart cartoon it, get you excited. So, so the, um, you can give a worst case analysis. You can give some of it. So if you have a Lyapunov function, the basic idea is you're always going downhill. If you allow that you can, with some probability, go uphill, but on bulk go downhill, then you get into martingales, right? And you can give stochastic stability guarantees in that setting. Sometimes those bounds are fairly weak, but they, they do exist. There's also things you can do it's with certain, if you're, the way that you go up and down satisfies some supply rate kind of conditions, then you can use dissipation inequalities to actually give pretty strong gain bounds, and that's the last piece of the story. So yes, I think, I think you can do some of that, absolutely. All right, let's break and I will just answer more project questions as, 